Now let's back up to 22. John 3, 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. John also was baptizing in Enon, near to Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. They came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth. And no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We pray you're blessed as we endeavor to expound it tonight in Christ's name. Amen. Now John the Baptist is a very unique character. The very fact that he was born in supernatural circumstances is not the least of which After his mother was past the age of childbearing, God supernaturally intervened for Elizabeth and Zacharias, and God intervened in that situation and allowed them to have a son. And the Bible said that this boy was destined to be the forerunner of of Jesus Christ, and that he was also filled with the Holy Spirit right in the very womb of his mother, sanctified while he was still in the womb. Isn't that an amazing thing? The supernatural hand of God was upon this man from the very point of conception all the way through. We don't know much about his years. The only thing the Bible says about his training is that he was in the wilderness until his showing unto Israel. In other words, he didn't stay in the local community with his mom and dad. It doesn't say whether mom and dad moved into the wilderness too. It doesn't say who was his tutor. It doesn't tell us what kind of education he had. But when he came out of the wilderness, he came as a roaring lion. (laughs) He came as bold as a lion. He began to preach the doctrine of repentance from sin and the necessity of repentance from sin. I have a sneaking suspicion that God was his tutor. I have just this sneaking suspicion that while he was in the wilderness, coming to maturity, coming to the full age of a man, that God was training John the Baptist. He had a unique outfit. His clothing was different. His diet was different. Ugh. You ever seen a locust? It doesn't look edible to me. Not even with lots of honey. And that was what the Bible says that John the Baptist's diet was locusts and wild honey. Must have been nutritious. It must have been all right because that's what he ate and that's what he prospered with. And I'll leave that with him, but I'm sure glad for beef roast and mashed potatoes myself. I kind of I think we're spoiled, don't you? We're kind of spoiled with this eating thing. We have the best of the best, and we have lots of it, and we ought to be thankful for it every time we sit down to a bountiful meal, how God has blessed us with such a bounty. But John the Baptist lived a life of separation from society, up until the very time that his ministry would begin. And then when his ministry began, it it began with phenomenal success. 
People came from all over the countryside to hear John preached and to, be, and to preach and to be baptized by him as he was baptizing. The church world, the ecclesiastical world came out to hear him preach and he, he skint them alive. He's, he gave them scathing messages, called them hypocrites and snakes told him to perform repentance, uh, to do repentance worthy and to, to do things that were worthy of the term repentance so that he could baptize them. He said, I'm not baptizing you till you bring forth fruit. Meat for repentance. Now John the Baptist was a radical. He was very radical for his day. And he came and he was baptizing. Now evidently the Jews were not, that was not a foreign thing to them. And there's been so much debate and, and so much schism in the church body over this little thing called baptism. Some say we baptize in Jesus' name. And those of us who listen to the scripture say we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some say you sprinkle, and some say you duck them under the water. Well, it's been long wrangled, and it's been long uh, fought over, and it's probably not over yet. They'll still be wrangling over baptism. And what does baptism do? Does baptism save me? No, baptism does not save you. It's symbolic of what God has already done in your heart. And that is, he's washed your sins away. You've died to the old life, and now you've been resurrected to walk in the newness of life. That's why I believe in immersion. Because you don't see that symbolism if I sprinkle you. You just don't see that. Paul said it's symbolic of being buried with Christ. You're out of sight for a moment. In just a moment, by the way, I've had some people that were really afraid to be baptized. We've not drowned any to this point. We've not lost a single customer. I almost lost a big guy in Fort Myers because of the undertow and because he was so much bigger than I was. And my partner over here, he was scared to death just to be in the water. So I had this great big man by one arm and his shoulder and uh, he was so heavy that he was sinking me into the sand. And we were right on the edge of the undertow to get deep enough. At that particular time, the tide was out. Uh, if I go to baptize in that place anymore, I'm going to make sure the tide's in. So you don't have to be out in the middle of the river to get the job done. Where it drops off very steeply. But I haven't lost anyone yet. But by immersion, you, you, you bury them. And you, you're dead to the old life. Then when you come out of the water, it's like a resurrection. You're a new creature. You've been given life. You've been brought from death to life. And in that time, it's all symbolic of what God has already done in your heart as a believer. Let me get another drink. My voice is going. But <clears throat> the very statement here uh, about this uh, lends credence to the, to the immersion theory talking about that they were there where there was, in verse 23, it said he had to pick a place where there was much water. And uh, you don't need a lot of water to sprinkle, do you? Just a teacup full of dew. Maybe a teaspoon. I don't know how much you want to be sprinkled with. But uh, if you're going to immerse somebody, you need enough water that's deep enough for them to cover them when they go down. And so I believe in the, I believe in the doctrine of immersion I believe in the doctrine of being baptized in the full name of the Trinity, which is what the Bible says. And they said, well, Peter said in the first chapter of Acts, second chapter of Acts, be baptized in Jesus' name. Well, he wasn't giving a new formula. He was just making sure you, you included Jesus in, in this ritual, in this matter of being baptized for Christ's sake. But John the Baptist makes some very, very important remarks here. And he, he shows outstanding humility because his ministry had flourished. His ministry had mushroomed. I mean, he was the talk of the country. People were coming from miles around. People coming from Jerusalem, everywhere, to hear him preach and to get under the message that he had for Israel. And friend, as he was, and then all of a sudden, the, these two camps are, are just a short ways apart. And John is still baptizing over here in Enon. And Christ's disciples are baptizing over here in another little place. And friend, the, the people looked at it as competition. The world looked at that as 
He's taking your territory. What do you think about that, John? Well, there was no rivalry in John's heart. And you know, there shouldn't be any rivalry in kingdom work. There should be no rivalry in kingdom work. This is all God's business. And uh, as John showed an intense amount of wisdom and spiritual discernment, as he gave them the answer, when they, they, you know, he said, a man can do nothing, receive nothing, except it be given him from heaven. And he said, I told you already, I'm not the Christ. John had already let it be known. He told those Pharisees and Sadducees, I'm not the Christ. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Make your paths straight. Get ready for the Messiah. He's coming. He's here. He's right among you and you know him not, John told them. You don't know him. He's right here. But John, in his answer to why there was no competition between these two camps, he said he must increase, the Messiah must increase, and I must decrease. He realized that his ministry was about over. He had done what God had prepared him for, had trained him for, had commissioned him for, and what had anointed him for. And friend, that's a wonderful thing to do is do your job and do it well and then there may be a time where someone else is going to increase and you're going to decrease. But as we do it for the work of the Lord, and John did, he said that, uh, he said it's kind of like a wedding, folks. He said you got the groom and you got the best man and you got the bride. He said the best man don't leave with the bride. It's the bridegroom. That leaves with the bride. I rejoice because he's come to get a bride. I'm rejoicing because this is his hour. He said, therefore, I rejoice just hearing his voice. You know, that is so sublime. That is so uh, special that John would feel that way about Jesus. They were cousins, by the way. Did you know that? But they, uh, they didn't spend any time together before John and Jesus met at the Jordan where John baptized. And as far as we can read in the scripture, they didn't. But Jesus had uh, let it be known and, and God the Father had let it be known that this was God's son. And John had, had come to such revelations that he could speak to Jesus. He that cometh from above is above all. He realized that he was just an earthly man. But of, of them that are born of women, Jesus said there's not have been a greater prophet than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said about him. That's a pretty good commendation when you think. When Jesus said of all those prophets, Elijah, Elisha, and all Daniel, and all those prophets, said there's not been a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But said he that is in heaven, the least is greater than that. But John had some insight He had some real insight about who Jesus was and what Jesus had come to do. He said, he that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. Isn't that sad? Now, some of the commentators believe that to be relative, not a totally... You know, that absolutely no one believed it because we know the disciples were following him. But in a relative sense, comparatively speaking, hardly anyone had believed his testimony. Of the multitudes that he had fed, 5,000 one time, 4,000 another time, plus women and children. And all the crowds on the day when he, when he went into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, and my, what a time. What a time Jesus had, but... Relatively few, relatively few had taken the way and decided to be his disciple. But John said, He that hath received his testimony hath set this to his seal, that God is true. What God said about Jesus is true, and what Jesus said about God is true, and the gospel is true today, and John realized that. He realized it. And we find it here that to he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God. 
I mean, he's not giving you his opinion. He's telling you what thus saith God the Father. And friend, we ought to pay attention. They ought to pay attention. But John realized it, that Jesus, Jesus had come to give them eternal life. He said, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. You know, there were even occasions in the Old Testament where God allowed the Holy Spirit to use people in circumstances, certain time frames, in certain measures. But he said he doesn't do that with Jesus. Jesus has a free flow of the Holy Ghost all the time. He has all without measure, without any boundaries, without any limits. Time doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what time you talk to Jesus. He's going to be full of the Spirit. It doesn't matter where you talk to Jesus. He's going to be full of the Spirit. Doesn't matter what circumstances Jesus is dealing with. He is equipped with all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Not just the Spirit, but the Father as well. He was the very fullness of the entire Godhead in bodily form. Can you get your mind around that? Jesus was God. He was man and he was God. And he came to do a mighty work. He came to do a work that men and women could find everlasting life. It says, the Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. Jesus said at one point in the, in the Gospels, he said, the Father has committed all judgment unto the Son. All judgment. You know, Jesus has all power, he said, in heaven and in earth. There's nothing, there's nothing our God cannot do. There's nothing that Jesus cannot do that is consistent with his will and his nature. You know, he will not lie for you. He will not lie for me. He will not overlook your sin and he will not overlook mine. Because he is holy and he is just. He is merciful, absolutely, and he is loving, but thank God, not one of his attributes outweighs the other. It's the perfect balance of justice and mercy. It's the perfect balance of love, of good, and hatred of evil. Our God is a perfect God. Jesus is a perfect God. He was a perfect man. He was a sinless sacrifice. He suffered and bled and died not for his own sin, but for yours and mine. Thank God tonight. I'm glad for that. I'm glad he did. I, I hate that he had to. I hate that mankind put God in the place where he had to give his life like that. But aren't you glad he was willing to do it? He was willing to do it. And verse 36, I've got it underlined in my Bible. You probably ought to highlight it some way in yours. He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. That E-T-H means something. <laughs> that E-T-H in the old English means it wasn't a one-time thing back there. You're still believing him today. If victory is yours and the relationship up to date, yes, I believe the Lord. November the 18th, 1978, I believed him at the altar and he saved me. Well, if I stop believing somewhere between there and here, I'm no better off. But he that believeth, he that takes his faith and contacts God and God contacts you and you'll maintain that faith, you'll maintain that relationship, friend, you have everlasting life in you already. Isn't that amazing? We have life begun here below. Everlasting life. Praise God. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. My, what a statement. What a statement from the very lips of John the Baptist. He that hath not the Son or believeth not the Son will not see life, will not see heaven, will not see eternity with God. Friend, that is a startling statement. You know, they came to Jesus one day and said, Lord, what can we do to do the works of God? You remember what Jesus told them? Believe on him that he has sinned. Faith is the victory. Faith is not static. Faith is not something that 
just operates once in a while. Faith is trust. Faith is reliance. Faith is full belief in who he is and what he can do. Praise God tonight. Church, we need our faith stirred. We need our faith increased. We need our faith rejuvenated. He's a great God tonight. He's a wonderful Savior tonight. He's a great God and King, and He's coming back. He's built us a home. The bridegroom is coming to get a bride. Do you have on the wedding garment? He that believeth on the Son has everlasting life. He that believeth not shall not see life. Two destinies, two positions. It's, it's all you'll ever find in Scripture. It's all you'll ever find in Scripture, friend, is two conditions. Lost, saved. Heaven, hell. Did you notice he didn't quit with that? He said, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Do you know what Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out two by two to preach through the towns of Israel in that day? He said, when you go into a town, he said, you preach to that people. He said, if they will not hear you, when you leave that city, you kick the dust off your shoes and it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Friend, God is not, uh, he's not a great big sugar daddy. He's not a grandma, grandpa figure that you can just wool, pull the wool over his eyes and anything goes and they just don't see a thing you do bad. Friend, God is righteous, he's just, he's holy and he's going to demand that you and I meet conditions and the condition for being saved is your faith and repentance to God. Amen. And it's worthwhile, it's worthwhile because he said here that the wrath of God will abide on you if you don't believe. Now, I've had, I've had a few people mad at me down across the years. I, that kind of was intimidating <laughs> because you didn't want to make some people mad. Of course, you didn't run into anybody like that in your lifetime, but I grew up with a lot of rough characters. I mean, really rough characters. There was a set of twins. Well, I, no, maybe they weren't twins. They were brothers. They looked like twins. Both of their biceps and arms were as big as my thighs. I mean, just monstrous guys. I mean, not fat, but I mean, they were just great big men. And you know what they like to do? They like to go into the bars and beer joints on Friday night and Saturday night. They get right in the middle of the place and they'll dare they'll take on anybody that wants to come. They just go in there and just clean house. Place after place. They just go clean the whole place out. Those kind of people you don't want mad at you. I mean, those are the kind of people you just don't want to be mad at you. But there's something worse than having people like that mad at you. It's having God, the anger and the wrath of God being against us, friend. I don't want God to be mad at me. Do you? I want to please him. I want to do what pleases him. He said, do you, you, do you sit in fear and trembling of the, of the wrath of God? No. But I stand in, in reverential fear of a God that has the power, friend, to either let me in or cast me out. He has the power to redeem my soul and accept me into heaven or he has the power to say, you didn't make the grade. Be gone, be cast into a lake of fire. Friend, I don't want to offend that kind of God. I want to live pleasing to him. I want to operate pleasing to him. I want to serve him with all my heart and love him with all my soul. And give him the best I have. Amen. So that one day he can say, well done. You believed. And you kept on believing. And you, you stayed faithful. You endured to the end. Come on in. The door is open. You know, that's going to be worth everything. Because hell is going to be as long in that eternity as heaven is in the other. We talk about where the saints will never grow old. We talk about 10,000 years and we'll just be started. <laughs> Those beautiful songs that reminisce about the, the longevity of heaven. Friend, if you stop and think about it, hell's going to be just as long. But a totally different picture. 
He said, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I don't want God to be angry with me. He said he's angry with the wicked every day. Sin is repulsive to God. Wickedness angers God. You know, God got so angry with this earth, at one point he destroyed it. So I don't believe that. Friend, there's evidences of the flood everywhere. We used to go up to the White Rocks. Down there in Lee County, Virginia, and there was a, there was a cave on the backside of those big rocks, pretty high elevation. And that cave was full of sand. I mean, how did a cave get full of sand on top of the mountain? Ain't no creeks run through that. This world was submerged one day. Whether you believe it or not, this world was underwater one time. And it was because God was angry with the wicked. He hasn't changed his mind about sin. The penalty for sin, the price tag of sin has not decreased. The wages of sin are still the same. It's death, eternal, never-ending death and punishment. But you don't have to do that. You don't have to go that route. Jesus is offering you and me eternal life. And the only thing we have to do is turn our back on sin and turn our face toward God and accept his wonderful provision and live for him and love him and live the best life that anyone could live down here. This is the best life you could live. Say, so I got to go get high tonight. I got to go get drunk. I got to go run around the town. I got to do this and that. Friend, let me tell you, this is the best life you could ever live is being a Christian. I've watched it. I came up on both sides of the fence. I've been on both sides. I'm here to tell you, this is the best way. But John the Baptist had a real insight into who Jesus was. When that voice came from the glory world that day, and that little white dove, I believe she was white. It doesn't say white in the scriptures, but I believe it was white. <laughs> that little dove fluttered down, symbolic, and it was the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. The Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus made the statement, my father is pleased. And the reason he's pleased is I always do those things that please him. There's your key. There's your key to that relationship. I always do those things that please him. And we're striving to do that, I hope. That should be our ambition to always please him. He said, but preacher, sometimes I feel like I don't measure up. I don't. I don't feel like I perform like I'd want to. Well, there's always room for improvement, but as long as your desire and motive in that thing was to please Him, your performance can be improved with prayer, discipline. But let's let God help us to love Him. Let's put our faith in Him. Let's believe unto everlasting life. Let's avoid that awful place of punishment. Amen. Shall we stand?